Uh, uh, as much as we've known over the years about delay, it is still remarkable that we do not have a particularly good way of measuring delay in you know, actual glass-to-glass -glass delay uh, in real systems. And uh, I think we have research scientist Jack Jensen, who works with uh, Dick Bolterman's group at CWI to uh, talk about their most recent tool for uh, trying to measure as accurately as possible, even with black box components, glass-to-glass uh, -glass, uh, uh, delay uh, in, in, in video conferencing. And so I'll turn it over to Jack. Thank you, Keaton. So, well, that was the introduction. The, uh, I guess that the, uh, the first question we uh, should look at, even though probably everybody here has looked at that question already, is uh, what is latency? And, uh, you know, I'm very happy with this cartoon of Geek and Poke because it saves me f five minutes. No one can read it. Ah, oh, oh, that's a shame. That's so it says, do you love me? And then he says, why don't you answer me? Is there another man? And the other side says, yes. And so your man disappears. And then the other side says, what do you mean? Of course not. <laughs> so that is latency. And what does this uh, cartoon teach us? The, uh, the main thing that the cartoon teaches us is that latency is a social issue. It's... Uh, uh, it is about human interaction, and if you have latency problems, it is going to affect the human interaction. And <coughs> of course, latency is also a systems issue. And you know, if you're doing codecs and whatever, and you want to compare your codec to somebody else's codec, you're interested in uh, in that latency difference. But in the end, it is about human interaction. And the other thing that uh, the cartoon teaches us is that it's uh, it's the round trip that is the most important number. It is, I don't really care when you hear what I say, it is when I see your reaction to what I said previously. Uh, and this is not completely true, of course, because if we have multiple, more than two people interacting, things get even hairier, but the round trip is more important than, than one-way uh, uh, latency. Um, what we're, uh, we're actually, we're, I mean, this is audio latency, because that's what the cartoon's about, but we are uh, more interested in, uh, in video latency, and, and actually we're more interested in video latency because it turns out to be an easier problem than, uh, than audio latency, uh, or measuring it, it turns out to be an easier problem. What we do want is we want to include all delay contributions, and that is not only protocol delay and codec delay, but it's also camera delay, display delay, you know, there are a lot of factors that contribute to, uh, to this delay. And we want to see, because we're interested in the, uh, in the human aspects, we want to measure all of these. <coughs> and yeah, as I said, we, uh, for now we are concentrating on video because it, uh, it happens to be easier. Um, I want to give you a quick, question, a quick, quick picture of the, uh, the setting that we as a group are operating in. Um, and we are uh, working in a, in a project uh, called VConnect, where we're doing um, uh, real-world uh, video conferencing, and we're interested in the uh, quality of experience with, uh, with respect to real-world constraints. So, not idealized video conferencing, but you know, you have band uh, bandwidth problems, you have uh, band bandwidth fluctuations, uh, people have you know asymmetric home networks what have you. And what can we do with video conferencing in that setting to uh, maximize the, uh, the perceived quality of experience? <coughs> and uh, so this is the, uh, to give you an idea of the sort of systems that we're looking at. It's the, uh, you see three pathways of video. So there's a, you know, the red arrow is a, a home client and you know, goes through an asymmetric modem and it goes through a video router and then it goes to a studio client and there is on a beamer it is presented on the big, big screen, and, and whereas the, uh, the green line is uh, the back channel for that same video, which goes from the studio client you know, with a, a big fat pipe to the video router, but actually the home client may have a smaller screen, so it needs to go out to a compositor and a scaler, which then you know, first decodes the packets and then does things to it and then re-encodes it, and then it goes back to the client. And, and you know, the blue link is actually uh, that same video stream, but it's going through two, two video routers because uh, there, there, there happens to be aggregation. Uh, let's say the one, the one set of clients is in the US and the other set of clients is in Europe and you want to aggregate those streams. So it's really the, the, the thing to get from this picture is that 
the, the, the video pathways uh, can be pretty complex and we want to understand you know, what happens if we start changing one of these components. What does it actually mean for the user perceived uh, quality of experience? So I can, uh, we can uh, summarize the problem statement as, uh, can we build a tool that measures this user perceived round trip delay easily and without affecting the system under test? And the, uh, so the buzzwords are user perceived and easily. And user perceived, well, that should be clear from the first slide. And uh, easily, why do we want to measure it easily? Because if we make it easy to take the measurement, we, um, uh, uh, we keep people honest. It means that I have no excuse not to do the measurement. It's, uh, you know, if the measurement is uh, complicated, I'll say, well, uh, you know, I'll change five parameters at once and then do the measurement because it's going to take me all afternoon. And if taking the measurement is easy, then I change one parameter and actually measure the effect, measure the effect of changing that one parameter. Uh, actually, without affecting the system under test is also important because it means that we can do, uh, uh, first of all, we, don't, we know that our, our measurement system doesn't skew our measurements. Uh, and in, addi in addition, uh, we can me measure black box systems like uh, commercial turnkey systems where you, you can't get in them. <coughs> Let's uh, look at some prior art for uh, uh, doing user perceived measurements. The, uh, the standard way to do this, this slide is completely un unreadable but that probably brings the point across. So the, uh, the standard way to do it is uh, uh, you take your conferencing system, uh, you put a clock in front of the camera, uh, you make sure that the clock and the output display are close to each other, you take a still camera, you take a picture, you take another picture, you take another picture, you take about a thousand of them, then you take a master student, who is going to inspect these thousand, he's going to inspect this picture, and then this picture, and then this picture, and he's going to see if he can see what this timestamp is, and see if he can see what this timestamp is, and then subtract the numbers, and then, you know, come back a week later with, uh, with the results. So this is, this fails the easy test. <coughs> um, there has been uh, work done on... Uh, uh, doing uh, user perceived delay measurements. The uh, uh, Oboyachi uh, and Henning Schulzrin did a tool called V-Delay, which was actually, uh, which triggered this work. Um, they measure capture to display uh, latency. So they don't measure the full, full chain, but at least they measure the input part and most of the output part. And uh, more recently, there's been uh, work done uh, that does measure, oh, sorry, that does measure the full chain uh, by Yang Su and some other people, and uh, but they do offline, so they do take a video, but they're basically uh, replacing the uh, the master student with uh, an OCR system, so they do take all the pictures and then they do offline OCR processing. So, how does the system work? Well, here on the left-hand side, you see uh, the video lat measurement system. And in the middle and the right, you see the, uh, the system under test. And uh, so you see how the cameras are pointing at the, uh, uh, at the various screens. And, uh, and what happens is that uh, a uh, machine-readable uh, pattern is generated, and it, you know, it transfers through the system. And as soon as it uh, comes back to the measurement system, uh, the clock stops. And uh, so now we know how long uh, the uh, uh, how long the pattern spent through uh, the whole system. Um, that's the theory. The uh, and then this is the practice. The uh, so here we uh, the display we see here. This is the uh, the video lat measurement system, and it shows a QR code and. Uh, so that QR code is then picked up by the video conferencing camera. It is sent to the video conferencing system. It is transmitted to England. Uh, it is transmitted back. And then there's here on the box of tissues, there's the white measurement camera. And the white measurement camera goes, you know, 
back into the video LAT system, and once it detects the same QR code as it has transmitted, it transmits the next QR code, and you just let this run for half an hour or something, and you have, uh, I don't know, 500 to 2,000 measurements, and, uh, and then you average them, uh, and then you have the number you want. Now, of course, people will say, yeah, but wait a minute, the delay of the video LAT system itself is part of what you're measuring. Yeah. So what do we do? We run a calibration whereby we just you know, measure this thing, and we do that a lot of times, and now we know the delay of the calibration, or now we have calibrated our measurement system, and, uh, and so we subtract that number from uh, the number that we measured pre previously, and now we know the delay of the system under test. And there's, um, I'm taking a few shortcuts here, really, because uh, we are assuming that these are all beautiful numbers. And statistics help us a lot here, because, because we can take 500,000, 5,000, how many measures you want, uh, that means that sort of the individual uh, contributions to the delay, they get sort of evened out. So what we do is uh, the output is, uh, you see the output here, and uh, no, if you couldn't read the previous slide and you can't read this one. So the mean here is uh, 94 uh, milliseconds, and the standard deviation is uh, about 15 milliseconds. Well, 15 milliseconds, you know, it sounds like a pretty reasonable number giving 30 to 60 uh, frame per second cameras and screens. Uh, also, it's to my non-mathematical eye, the orange line is the uh, is the normal distribution with that mean and standard devi deviation, and you know that blue pattern, which is the actual measurements. Well, uh, it's good enough. So, so we know that the that we sort of understand our measurement system, which means that we can trust the measurements that come out of it, which means that we're probably fine by subtracting this mean from the mean that we measurement, measure of the system under test. So let us look at the, uh, so that was uh, how the system was built and how the system operates. Let's look at some of the choices that we made while uh, designing uh, the system. So I've already said statistics. Um, taking many measurements uh, means that we can use the statistics to even out all the components that we don't understand. And that is very useful because that, uh, it saves us a lot of thinking about the individual components so that we can concentrate on, on the number we really want to measure, the user perceived delay. <coughs> Sorry. The uh, separate measurement system means that we can uh, measure closed systems and we don't uh, influence the system uh, under test and it also eases uh, deployment. And it's, it's actually, right now the system runs on a, on a laptop. I can demonstrate it you know, afterwards if people want to see it. I'm not going to demonstrate it now because then it'll fail. But if I do it in the whole way, you know, there is a, a chance that it'll work. Um, actually, I'd, I'd really like to port it to an iPhone. I'd really like a system where you just, you know, you, you walk up to the system and you sort of hold this in front of it and, you know, you get a number. But that's for the future. <coughs> Um, the machine readable patterns, that was, uh, that, that's another interesting one. We, uh, we experimented with various patterns and we decided for QR codes. QR codes have the big advantage that they're self-checking, uh, which means that you know, once your detection module says you have a detection, you can, you can trust that it's actually a correct measurement, which is with stuff like barcodes, this is not true. Um, and they are, uh, they're, they're, you, know, you can read them under an angle, you can actually read them mirrored. Reading them mirrored is, is very important because if you have a closed conferencing system, you know, it might have the camera physically attached to the screen, so you can't point the camera at the screen on the remote end, but then you just put a mirror in front of it and uh, you know, a QR code is still detected, detectable when, uh, when mirrored. <coughs> and the uh, QR codes have the slight disadvantage that they're relatively expensive to, uh, to detect, but because we're running on a separate system, we don't care. It just means we're, uh, you know, a measurement is going to take a bit longer, but we don't care because we can subtract this number uh, from, our, uh, from our measurement. So, does it actually work? Um, 
Yeah, we think it does. The, uh, uh, I'm going to quickly talk through three measurements we've taken with this system that are pretty difficult to take with another system, uh, except for the uh, uh, you know, still shots and, uh, and grad students' uh, approach. The, um, we had a, a commercial uh, conferencing system, uh, and uh, the thing we were interested in is you could do point-to-point -point conf uh, video conferences, uh, or you could do video conferences through an MCU. And our question was now, if you uh, do a two-person video conference through an MCU, uh, do we see uh, the same delays as for a point-to-point -point conference, or do we see an additional delay, you know, uh, more than the, uh, the, the extra uh, uh, RTT uh, uh, time? Because really, you know, if, if, the, if we're doing a three-person conference, the MCU has to do a lot of work. It has to decode all the packets and composite them on the screen and re-encode them. And does it take a shortcut? And does it actually, if, if it knows there's a two-person conference, does it actually shunt the packets through? Um, so we did that experiment, and uh, it turns out that, uh, no, the MCU is not smart. It, uh, the blue figures here are the, uh, uh, the direct point-to-point uh, -point, uh, conference, which had a, uh, so it's about 850 uh, milliseconds. And if we added an MCU, uh, then it went up to uh, 1,100 milliseconds. And the, uh, we did measure the... Uh, on the same network, we measured the, uh, the RTT times. And, uh, and that was, you know, went from 125 milliseconds to 137 milliseconds. So that's not the contributing factor. It's really, uh, I mean, we spend an extra 250 milliseconds. So that means that the bridge must do, uh, or we assume that the bridge does uh, decoding and re-encoding. <coughs> the only other way to do this measurement would have been manual. Um, at another uh, uh, measurement we took, again in the, uh, in the context of, uh, of vConnect, uh, we have our own video conferencing uh, uh, system and uh, we weren't happy with, uh, with the performance. So uh, a suggestion was that we use Direct2D as opposed to GDI for, uh, uh, for rendering, because Direct2D uses the, uh, um, the graphics card a lot more and we thought that this might help. Uh, but then, you know, you've done it, and yeah, it looks sort of okay, but does it really work? So uh, we measured it, and it's the, uh, here the red line is the, uh, the old GDI renderer, and the, uh, and the blue graph is the new uh, Direct2D uh, uh, renderer, and it is indeed uh, 50 milliseconds uh, faster. And it's an, an, an interesting additional result is that you can see that it's more, you know, it's shaped, it has a nicer shape. The, uh, the GDI rendering has a very long tail. We haven't investigated this more, but we assume that because GDI is more CPU based, that we're getting into cache contention stuff and, uh, or swapping out or whatever. And, but, but at least this proved that what we did was actually uh, was worth it. <coughs> uh, again, the GPU is a black box, and even if you have a tool, you know, measuring CPU performance, that's easy. There may be tools that help you to measure GPU performance, but there are no tools that allow you to compare. CPU performance to GPU performance. So we just treat it as a black box, we measure the end result, and, uh, and then uh, we get these, uh, these numbers out. And a, uh, a very, well, um, I, I really like this measurement, because it's, uh, we were, um, we're talking about video conferencing in, a, in the home. And you know, these home television sets, they are all smart. Uh, I mean, it's the, the days of uh, you know, glass tubes that had a, uh, a scanning electron ray are, are long past us and they have all these, they do things. And the question is, what do they do? And you know, nobody will tell you. And it's definitely not in the manual because it's just going to talk about rich colors and, uh, uh, and, and stuff. So how much delay does such a television uh, introduce? So we started experimenting with the, uh, with the television and lo and behold, uh, it can be quite a lot. So the blue graph here is the television is in its uh, sort of standard dynamic mode. So it does things to the color uh, and stuff. And the television manual said it has a game mode, which is, you know, you may lose a bit of quality, but for gaming it's good. And indeed, if you look at the graphs, that uh, uh, there is a, on average, there is a 100 milliseconds difference between having your television in uh, game mode 
and in dynamic mode. And moreover, as you can see from the, from the shape of the graph, that you know, there's a very long tail in the, uh, in the dynamic mode. So this means, I mean, if you think of the number, if you think of 100 milliseconds, I mean, it is forever. Uh, you know, people, people kill for sh shaving off 100 milliseconds of their H.264 encoder uh, time. Uh, so that's all brilliant work, and by all means, continue shaving off 100 milliseconds of your, uh, your H.264 uh, encoder. But, you know, you might also want to sort of check the various buttons on your television and see if you can uh <laughs> get that same from a user point of view, of course, not from presenting papers at conferences, but from a user point of view, you may get, uh, it may be actually very easy to, uh, to get those numbers. Uh, and this is again, you know, this is, these are the type of measurements. Because you have the tool, you do them. If you didn't have the tool, you wouldn't do them. Uh, what else is there? Discussion. So again, operator convenience is the key. Make a tool that uh, allows people to take as many measurements and as often as they, uh, uh, as they want. Uh, we want the iPhone version, just again for ease of use. Uh, audio, audio and audio video sync, that, that is really the next important question because actually lip sync is even more important than, than, than latency and, and audio latency is possibly more important than video latency. Uh, why haven't we done it yet? Well, the thing is, uh, audio is more difficult. <laughs> and audio is more difficult because, uh, because of the echo suppression. And, you know, luckily nobody implemented uh, echo suppression for video because people tend not to point their cameras at their screens. But with audio it is. So uh, we're, we're looking at that. And we may be able to get, you know, small spikes through quickly. And we may have to, you know, introduce a helper app on the remote end where you send out a, a thousand hertz tone and then you, you answer with a 1500 hertz tone or something like that. We, uh, we still need to look at that. And the, uh, oh, the, the software is open source. It's available at uh, SourceForge. And you know, if you have your camera, that's the, uh, the, the QR code for the link to the SourceForge page. Thank Great. you. Let's thank our speaker. All right, any uh, questions? Hi, I'm Dominic at TU Berlin. Why do you say they are user perceived? I mean, where's, why is it user perceived? I just know it from audio conferencing that round trip times up to two seconds may not be perceived from a user. Yeah. It's okay, the user perceived is a bit, it is open to discussion. Because the I am assuming, sort of, and I know that that is incorrect, that uh, you know a laptop detecting a QR code is similar to a human detecting a facial expression, and uh, but I think at least that this is closer than what you get from other tools, because at the very least you know it does include everything in the pipeline. Does that answer your question or? Have I sidestepped it? That's you're absolutely right. Uh, point taken. It is the uh, um, the the thing is that that I don't think that that is measurable uh, is machine measurable because it's really you know the qu what is the quality of experience of our conversation? You know, if I spoke Chinese and 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 you spro spoke Basque, then you know we can get any number with a system but the quality of experience of our conversation would be rather limited. So it's, I don't think that you can, really measure, you can really measure that. What I do think is that with a tool like this, you get at least closer uh, to a meaningful number than by just measuring packet delays. Okay, uh, another question. Uh, Otto Witten from Unit. 
Uh, I've been doing measurements myself uh, lately with the, uh, some flashing LEDs and, and uh, well, the manual style. And this seems very convenient and uh, I think I'll test it. But uh, I was wondering the, the accuracy of your measurement systems. I'm not, uh, your measurement system, yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have something similar. There's, there's more in the paper. We do flashing okay. LEDs as well. Okay. There's, uh, I've in the talk, I've shown part of the system. But there's actually, uh, there's, uh, there's actually not all that much more. There's a bit more detail in the paper. Uh, we do, there are ways to measure part of the system uh, as well and to take different types of measures. And this is the, uh, this is the hardware with the, uh, the flashing LEDs and the, uh, uh, the opto, the, the right. light uh, sensitive transistor. Yeah, so yeah. We, can, we can do more measurements. But the, but the accuracy of your other system, I mean, the, the, the convenient one, uh, how, how accurate is it? How do you have... The hardware system is, has an accuracy of 4 milliseconds. Right, but the, your software system, how... The QR software system, you said? The QR software system, yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's what we see is we see a standard deviation of... Okay, so the, the, the diagram should... Uh, uh, so we see for the self-measurement, we see a standard deviation of, uh, of 15 milliseconds. Uh, 15, 15 milliseconds. So that is, um, I, I still don't fully understand how these displays work. Uh, you know, most of it has been measured, or it has all been measured on Macintoshes and mainly laptops. And these displays are funny. I noticed that if I ex attach an external display, I get a much higher spread I get a much higher standard deviation. Uh, so the external displays do s you know, have a frame rate. I get the impression that these built-in displays don't have a frame rate. Because that 50 milliseconds, you know, that is, I'm using an external camera, you know, if it's a 60 hertz, uh, a 60 frame per second camera, well, that's, that's the 50 milliseconds, which would sort of suggest that the display doesn't have a delay, which is, or doesn't have a sorry doesn't have a delay variation, which I don't understand. But you know, luckily I don't have to. <laughs> I can mention that I used a flashing bicycle lamp in my uh, my uh, optical. <laughs> the flashing bicycle lamp. Yes, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we need to <laughs> we need to talk offline. <laughs> Yeah, I, um, I had a similar question actually about the precision of the device of the camera actually, how mm -hmm. precise the camera is, if it is 30 hertz or 60, and actually the displays do 100 hertz, right, and higher, 120 hertz when they display, right, mm -hmm. from the, from the mm -hmm. buffer. Um, so you, you answered some of those, but I was curious if you have done some uh, comparative experience uh, between you observing what's currently displays in in software measurements, right? Currently, a lot of the related work, one of the work that I know from Benoit, right? He has been sort of doing this latency is a social issue with restaurants, right? Mm -hmm. He actually sort of reported that many people actually lost reservation customers because of the delays, right? Uh, but he oh. actually was measuring it in the application software. Uh, and so there basically the uh, aspects that you have been mentioning, the TV buffering and the displays, and I was sort of curious uh, if you have any comparisons, how much it's more currently you are seeing delays with these techniques versus if I do in-application measurements. Okay, so I was, I was going to uh, pit this against uh, V-delay uh, and there wasn't any time. But if I'm completely honest, uh, I am pretty sure that, you know, if you let this tool and an in-system tool, you know, run for a week, that you will see that there's going to be a, an almost constant <laughs> uh, difference. So you could say, well, you know, you run, you use this tool once, and then you know the unknowable parts of the delay, but they're probably going to be constant. You know, the chance that my camera is, is going to have a, uh, a delayed drift over a week. I don't believe it. So it's... That would be interesting. That would be interesting to see that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But still, the, and, and you know, still that even if this tool is useful once, and after that you might as well do in-system measurements, the convenience of just, you know, pointing the camera at a screen 
and you know letting it run over lunch and then uh, and then you have a number uh, thank you uh, I'm Jin Xi Xu. I'm from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And I focus on a research, uh, something I really like your research, um, which will be presented after tomorrow, is about the measurement of the uh, delay and quality in video conferencing system. Mm -hmm. And uh, actually, I have a problem when I measure the delay. That is, uh, if you measure the delay with a single picture or a cord, then the bit weight may be low. But if you measure the delay with a uh, moon fan video, then the bit rate may be high and the delay may be different at that time. So if you are uh, measuring this simple system, then uh, I don't think the delay is so precise. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, the thing is that uh, the, that is a, a similar, I, I already mentioned, you know, a, a computer detecting a QR code is different from a human detecting a facial expression. It's also clear that you know an H.264 encoder or decoder will react differently to human faces than to QR codes, and uh, that is something that I would I would really like to. So maybe we also need to talk. I would really like to look into that because I know that uh, there's been a lot of work on the quality of, for example, H.264 encoders and you know user perceived quality and trying to measure that something that is close to user perceived quality. I, I would like to add something like that to this tool as well. But it's, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right, point taken. All right, let's thank your speaker once on. <coughs>